All right, so Sister Maria had asked about the um, the prophecies in the in the latter part of Ezekiel, and we're going to actually look at some of these prophecies this morning. But those of you who are familiar with the book of Ezekiel, I think you will understand why this is always a a question, and it's always a difficult question because many of the things that are said there in in the latter part of Ezekiel are very difficult to place. When will they happen? What do these prophecies mean? I'm definitely not going to be looking at all of them this morning, but I'm, I want to look at a few of them. And I want to try to establish a principle in terms of how we understand these prophecies, because I think it's better if we do this rather than trying to look at every single prophecy and, and try to understand what does this one in particular mean. If we can get some general principles of interpretation, then we can apply it to all of them. And so we can kind of work things out on our own if we get the principle. So I want to go first of all, uh, let me go to the Bible. And I want to um, show us, I don't remember exactly what chapter Sister Maria had asked about, but I know it was in the, in the, in the latter part of, of the book of Ezekiel. And so that's where we're going to go. Um, we're going to start with, let's give our attention to the left-hand panel. Um, Ezekiel 36, I'm going to read a long passage here. And um, you will realize why, why I read the entire thing when we come to the end. But I'd like us all to pay attention as we read because, and, and, and what I want you to be asking is, when is this prophecy to be fulfilled or when was this prophecy fulfilled? As a matter of fact, since it's supposed to be our Sabbath school time, I'm going to be asking some questions, all right? I, I don't really want long interruptions, really. I find that this is really um, disturbing some people and, and, and preventing them from following the train of thought. But I'm going to ask questions because I want to make sure that you're following what I'm trying to say. Now we're going to read from verse 17 down to about verse 38. And um, this is Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36. It says, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. Wherefore, I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen and they were dispersed through the countries. According to their way and according to their doings, I judged them. And when they entered unto the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, these are the people of the Lord and are gone out of his land. Now, somebody, could somebody an answer me? What is this referring to? Anybody, what is this referring to? Who is it referring to and, 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 and when? Sister, Sister Janet, your mic is on. Oh, no. Okay. Well, when you look at the, the, the statements there, it seems clear that this is referring to ancient Israel, Israel according to the flesh. Look at the things that God says they did. Let me just, um, it says, when they dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and their doings. And God says, I poured my fury upon them. I scattered them among the heathen. And this literally was fulfilled because you know that the 10 tribes of Israel, they were taken away by, by the Assyrians and they were scattered to the four winds. Nobody knows exactly where they are right now. Although some people claim, make all kinds of claims. Herbert W. Armstrong, the Worldwide Church of God, they claim that these, these descendants of these 10 tribes, they migrated over to England and to Europe and that they are actually, these 10 tribes are actually the people of England and America today because they migrated from America, from England to America. And so they claim that the Americans and the, and the British are the real Israelites today, plus the people down in Palestine. And this might help you to understand why some people have such an obsession with the relationship between America and Israel. There are all kinds of 
background ideas behind some of these things. Anyway, God says he scattered them. And when they when they went among the heathen, God says they 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 still dishonored his name because people were saying about them, these are the people of the Lord and they are gone out of the, his land. So because of what happened to God's people, God himself was getting a bad name. That's what God is saying, right? So it's clear it's talking about ancient Israel. Let's go on. God says, but I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Anywhere they went, they profaned God's name. And so God says, therefore, thus, therefore say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen, whither you went. God says, I'm going to do something. And I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it because of my holy name that you, you profaned, you dishonored, you disgraced. You know, I should really um, put a, 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 a simpler translation on the right hand side. Just, you know, maybe we can, we can read as we go along, maybe something like the New International Version. Um, and from time to time, we can make reference to it. All right. Um, verse 23, back on the left pane, God says, and I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am Yahweh. I am Jehovah. I am the Lord, said the Lord Jehovah. When I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Now look at the next verse. Let, let's follow the next verses going down now. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and I will bring you into your own land. Right, Brother Joe, I don't know if you want to say something. Your mic is making some noise. Do you want to comment? Okay. Um, so, so what is God promising to do here? Notice what God says. I'm going to take back the children of Israel from among all the different lands where they have been scattered, and I'm going to bring them into their own land. Now, we have been talking about physical Israel being physically scattered into physical countries. They went away to Assyria and all, all, all the nations. They were scattered, and God says, I'm going to take you from among these heathen and bring you into your own land. That's God's promise. Now look what ha happens next. Then he says, then I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. Let me ask you, did this ever happen to the nation of Israel? Does anybody know of any, any time that this ever happened to the nation of Israel? No. Brother, Brother Vikan, I think it is. Yes, Brother Vikan is bold enough to say no. And I agree with him. Uh, and, and, and furthermore, I would, I would extend the question by asking, does anybody expect that this prophecy is something that applies the physical Israel. Because it goes on to say in verse 27. Yeah. And I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. These two verses 26 and 27. This is a prophecy of what? Somebody help me. New covenant. Thank you sister Diane. This is a prophecy of the new covenant. So. It seems a bit confusing because God starts out talking about physical Israel. And all of a sudden, he jumps to spiritual Israel and he's, he talks about the problem of physical Israel and the solution is given to spiritual Israel, not physical Israel. So in the middle of the prophecy, in the middle of the prophecy, you have to stop thinking physical and you switch to spiritual. Does everybody understand what I just said? Let me put it another way. Is there anybody who does not understand what I just said? Because this is one of the most important principles when it comes to understanding Old Testament prophecy. 
I have, I have, I have struggled with it for many years, and I've seen people come up with all kinds of confused interpretations because they don't understand this principle. It's all over the Bible, but especially in the Old Testament. And we have discussed this when we were talking about um, the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel, because it's more clearly illustrated in those two books. But especially the Old Testament prophecies, you have a hard time distinguishing where it jumps from physical Israel to spiritual Israel. Now, of course, if, if you are a Jew or you are somebody who doesn't believe in the Old in the New Testament, you will think that all these prophecies apply to physical Israel. And this is one of the reasons why evangelicals, and I, I want to emphasize here, American evangelicals, because American evangelicals are a unique breed of people. Most of us consider ourselves to be evangelicals in some kind of way. But American evangelicalism is 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 tending towards what we call Zionism, where it is very heavily fixated on the, the physical nation of Israel. They, they still believe, majority of them, those, those uh, popular preachers like um, Hagi and um, Jake, T.D. Jakes, and um, you know people like Kenneth Copeland, and, and all of these people, most of the people who are popular evangelical preachers, they, they believe that the nation of Israel are still God's special people and God has a plan to bring back Israel to himself and, and he's going to set up Israel among all the other nations, above all the other nations, and that it is their duty as Christians to, to labor for the exaltation of physical Israel and that God will bless those who bless physical Israel. What they have created is a mongrel, a mongrel, a mongrelized version of the new covenant where they a hybrid where they have tried to join the old covenant with the new covenant as far as israel as far as physical israel is concerned and this is one of the reasons why their interpretations of prophecy are so confused confused and inconsistent in, in one way they emphasize the new covenant they reject the sabbath they, re, they reject um some of the, the the elements that are are involved in 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 the, in the old testament worship but in another sense, they are even more Old Testament oriented than Sabbath keepers. As a matter of fact, most of us will recognize that what they what they believe, they believe in 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 setting up the kingdom of God on earth. The, these people, most of them, they embrace something that we refer to as kingdom theology. I've said it before, and I'm going to repeat it. All of us believe in the kingdom. We 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 have we have kingdom theology. But our, our theology of the kingdom is different and it is more scriptural. We believe in the kingdom of God within you. We believe you, you set up the kingdom of God by propagating the gospel in the hearts of men. And as people believe the gospel, the kingdom of God is being established in the hearts of men. Not so these people. They believe that it is their duty to set up a kingdom of God similar to the kingdom of ancient Israel. And this is one of the reasons why you see them so involved in politics. Their idea is that America is to become something like ancient Israel was, a kingdom of God, where, which, is, which is governed by, by a theocracy. And of course, they see themselves as having a, a major part in this theocracy. And that is why they are so focused on political issues and promoting a certain political perspective. I don't. I don't get involved in politics. I don't want to. But you can't. But this is not politics. This is. This is. This is Bibli This is the Bible. This is. This is false interpretation of the Bible, leading to a certain kind of mindset. And this is why, even though it seems like most Christians are are are, are supporting one particular political party, I can't do this because I see the dangers in both sides. One. One party is promoting sin in a certain way, the other party is promoting it in a different way, equally or more dangerous. And it is, it is blindness that makes Christians believe, I can embrace this one above this one, and God is with this one and not with this one. Satan is working from both sides. And it, it, it is, it is short-sightedness that prevents us from seeing this if, if we don't see it. Sister Di, I don't know if you wanted to say something. Go ahead. 
I have a question. This prophecy here, verse 26, while it might be talking about the new covenant, he still wanted to do the new covenant with Israel. And when the spirit of when the spirit of God uh, was poured out upon the people, they were all Hebrew Israelites. I mean, you know, Acts 2 was Jews. They were not Gentiles. And so that he still wanted to make this covenant with them. Now they would not, they did not enter into it. That's according to Hebrews. So I don't see, I see him jumping to the new covenant, but I still see him. That's what he wanted for, for them. And he did kind of start it with them and it didn't go directly to the Gentiles. It went through those disciples and they were all Jews. Yes, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to come to that in just a moment. I'm going to say something more about that in just a moment, and I agree with you. Um, let, let's look at the, 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 a couple of other verses from the same passage, and then we will go to that other passage I have in mind. Um, and so he goes on to say, and you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. So when he talks about the land here, he seems to be saying the same land that you were taken out of, I'm taking you back to that land. And you shall be my people and I will be your God. And the, the reason why, you know, I, 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 I hesitate a little bit to say that he, he, this is the Jews he's talking about is because it's not, it's, it, it's, it's what he says I will do. And it's what he says will happen. And it never happened to the Jews. It happened to somebody else. And yet God, God factored this into the prophecy, even though we don't see it here. It's factored into the prophecy. So it, it, it promises. It includes a part of the, the promise includes the land that I gave to your fathers. And uh, it goes on a little further and it says, I will multiply the fruit of the trees and the increase of the field. It seems to be talking about even physical blessings. And, um, you know, my father, my father had a belief that I never agreed with. God, my father believed that the, uh, some of these prophecies in Ezekiel were fulfilled when the, 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 the Jews went back to Palestine. Uh, in May 14, 1948, Israel was recognized as a, a sovereign state by the United States of America. You know that Israel didn't exist, the state of Israel. It was after World War II that they, the nation of England and America and a couple of others got together and they established a, 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 a homeland, a place, a country for the Jews. And that's when Israel as a nation became established. And you know, the problem you have between the Jews and the Palestinians, even on the Palestinians, even until today, is partly because when they set up this state and, and named it a Jewish state, there were there were already Palestinians living in the in the in the area. And um they just took the place and they gave it to the Jews. But anyway. Some of these prophecies in Ezekiel are so striking. They seem to be so striking that not only my father, but a lot of Christian Bible students have come to the conclusion that the, re the return of the Jews to Palestine was a fulfillment of some of these Ezekiel prophecies. I never agreed with him, and I still don't. I still don't agree with him. Maybe he changes his mind later in life. But the thing is that um, the the prophecies are inextricably linked to the New Testament, the New Covenant, and so you can't say this part applies to physical Israel, and it was fulfilled because they have gone back to the land. But the part about sprinkling clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your sins, these New Testament prophecies apply to the church. But the promise of the land applies to the Jews. You can't say this. That's not consistent. So I'm going to go to the other passage that I mentioned, which is um, which is Jeremiah. We're all familiar with this prophecy in Jeremiah, but I'm going to go back to it in Jeremiah chapter 31. Look at what God says. It's a similar prophecy, similar prophecy, and um, but it's worded a little differently. It's from verse 31 down. It says, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Again, notice, God says this covenant is to be made with who? Two groups of people, the house of Israel, number one, and number two, the house of Judah. And for those of you who don't know, 
Israel and Judah became two different nations. We, we, we say ancient Israel, and they were one people at one point. In the days of Solomon, Solomon and David and Saul, it was one nation. But after the death of David, when Solomon, after the death of Solomon, when his son Rehoboam became king, there was a rebellion because of the way he treated the people. And, and the nation actually split into two and became two nations. Ten of the tribes went away under a man named Jeroboam, and they formed the southern, the northern kingdom, which was called sometimes Ephraim. And more often it was called Israel. The southern kingdom, which, which stayed with the descendants of David, the, the, the descendants of David continued to rule over the southern kingdom. They were called Judah. And they are the people who became the Jews. So the Jews you see in the New Testament, they are not the 10 tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. They are just basically the Judah plus Benjamin, Benjamin went with them, went with them, Benjamin went with them, and also the Levites went with them. So it was really Judah, Benjamin, and Levi that made up the Jews. There are 12, 10 tribes, Manasseh and Zebulun and Dan and Asher and all the rest of them. They were scattered up by the Assyrians. The Assyrians destroyed that country and scattered them to the four winds. So notice what God says. He says he will make the new covenant with both houses, the house of Israel as well as the house of Judah. And it's very clear that we are here speaking about the Christian people, Christian church, because he goes on to say, not according to the covenant that I made with your fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt with my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, said the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Again, notice God says, I will make this covenant with the house of Israel. Now, how do we know that this is not speaking of the literal Jews? Because in the book of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul tells us what this really applies to. Paul interprets it for us. We, we might study the Bible and come to our own conclusions, but the greatest authorities we have are the New Testament writers, Jesus and the apostles. And as I, I would say Jesus and especially Paul, because Paul was specially taught by Christ to understand the gospel. So these New Testament writers are the people we go to when we try to understand what do what does what does this what do these old testament prophecies really 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 mean so um look at what paul says beginning from verse 7 of hebrews chapter 8 look in the right panel hebrews chapter 8 for if that first covenant had been faultless then should no place have been sought for the second paul is talking about a first covenant and a second covenant for finding fault with them god finds fault with the jews he said Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He's quoting here from the book of Jeremiah that we just read. And he goes on and says, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers and so on and so forth. And he goes down to verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, said the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and write them in their minds and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall no more teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. So Paul is here saying that this is the experience of God's people today. And he was not speaking to Jews in particular. He was speaking to Christians in general, Jews and Gentiles. And he says, in that he saith a new covenant, he has made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. He's here saying that the old covenant is about to vanish away. It has grown old and it is, it is rotting away and it's about to vanish. So God has made a new covenant. So he's saying this new covenant has been made. The, 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 the prophecy has been fulfilled. And brothers and sisters, the fulfillment was not to physical Israel, but to spiritual Israel. 
Now let's go go back to verse. Let's go back to Jeremiah. Look on the left panel, Jeremiah. Back to the book of Jeremiah, because I'm interested in what God goes on to say in verses 35 and 36. Look at what God says. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divided the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. All right, so he establishes that he gave these ordinances and he is Yahweh. He is Jehovah of armies. And look what he says. If these ordinances depart from before me, said the Lord, said Jehovah, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Notice how God swears. He says that the only way that Israel will stop being a nation before him is if the sun stops shining these ordinances stop operating look what he says in verse 37 thus said the lord if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth can be searched out beneath i will also cast off all the seed of israel for all that they have done said the lord what he's saying is that i will never cast off israel and before that happens these ordinances of the sun and the moon and the stars and the sea and the waves, they will have to cease. That's what God says here. So the, the, the point is, how could God make statements like this? And yet Jesus says that the Jews have been cast off. Paul says that the Jews were cast off. How could God make statements like this? Because you see, as, as I pointed out when we were looking at the previous uh, passage, built into the passage, it's the reality that the prophecy cannot fail. There's something there that is brought out in this in this passage. And in fact, let me just uh, uh, Paul expresses it in Romans chapter two, I believe, and I think it's in the last part of Romans chapter two. Let me find it very quickly. And um, is it chapter two? Yeah, Romans two. Look at verse twenty nine. Let's start from verse twenty eight. For he is not a Jew, which is which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter. Whose praise is not of men but of God. What Paul shows us here is that instead of changing the prophecy, God did not change the prophecy. What God changed was the definition of Israel. See if we get that point. So, so the prophecy is perfectly fulfilled. The house of Israel has not been cast off. The house of Israel is still special to God. But the meaning of Israel has changed. And that is, that is how you have the prophecy still being fulfilled, perfectly fulfilled. Because God, what God has done, he has redefined the meaning of certain things. I'm going to try to establish a, a principle. That I'm going to ask you all to consider. I'm going to ask all of us to consider. And the principle is this. Whenever we're looking at, at prophecies in the Bible, as soon as we step across AD or BC1, or B, B, AD31, AD31, as soon as we step across AD31 when Jesus died, these prophecies need to be interpreted in a spiritual way. If you don't understand what I just said, let me know. As soon as you, if you are, if you are looking at a timeline, as soon as you step across a prophecy, and it goes past the date AD thirty-one into the time of the new covenant, we should interpret it in a spiritual way, and we should stop looking at the physical interpretation. So, so the principle is the principle we see we see established is that after AD thirty-one, the definitions change. So, back to the book of Ezekiel, because what I'm trying to say is that in Ezekiel, the, the references to Israel going back to their own land and having uh, water poured upon them and receiving a new spirit and a new heart, these prophecies need to be applied in a spiritual way and not a physical way, because they're after AD 31. And so the rest of the prophecies in the book of Ezekiel from, from, from chapter 36 going forward here, 
as a matter of fact, it may be true in the whole book, but I'm just I'm just looking at from 36 forward because those are the passages that I was examining over this week. All of these promises and prophecies in the in, in the book of Ezekiel, they have to do with after the time of the new covenant. And so they have to be applied and understood in this spiritual way. I'm going to look at a, a, a couple of other passages in Ezekiel, but before that, David. David. Yes, Brother Wayne. Um. Right. I was just thinking that. Just a moment. Move on until he's ready. I'm thinking that too. All right. Okay, Wayne. As soon as you connect it up back, you can you can maybe give me a, a, a sound. Um, what I want to look I'm here. at. I'm here, David. All right, go ahead. So I was saying, if salvation was for the Jews physically, wouldn't that therefore mean that you would have to create a, a separate salvation for the Gentiles? Number one point. Number two, um, the, if salvation was for the Jews um, physically, the way it was presented, and just for the Jews, what would have happened to those who weren't Israelites back in the Old Testament time? Wasn't there any salvation for them? Right. And the, the thing is that people, people don't say salvation was only for the Jews. What they say is that the Jews are the special element in salvation. God still has them in the, in the center of his purposes for the planet. And they are still cherished and loved by God and, and treated in a special way, even though they have rejected Jesus Christ. They have made God bound by, by the circumstances of, of nationality and, and race. They have bound God by these things. And so they have turned the, the plan of salvation into a physical thing instead of something spiritual. That's what they try to do. Now, look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 is one of those passages that probably I can, I can find empathy with. We all can empathize with it because we know that in Matthew 24, Jesus does the same kind of thing. He does the same thing. Jesus mixes up two different ages in one prophecy. Do we all understand this or do I need to go through it? Matthew 24, Jesus mixes up two ages, two, two, two events, 2,000 years apart, and he presents it as one event. Because in Matthew 24, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, they say, um, tell us, in verse 3, tell us, when shall these things be? He showed them the temple and, and told them that it was going to be destroyed. He told them that, there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So he told them the temple was going to be destroyed. And they came to him and they said, tell us, when shall these things be? Number one, when? Secondly, what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Now we know that the temple was destroyed 2,000 years ago. And we know that the coming of Jesus is 2,000 years later, sometime in our day, hopefully, expectedly. But it's 2,000 years apart. And they came to ask Jesus about two events, 2,000 years apart. And Jesus gave them one prophecy. And because of this, many people, I believe, expected that once they saw the temple destroyed, it was to be the end of the world. But it wasn't. And um, he, he just gives them, if you read through Matthew 24, we're not going to do it now. But you read through Matthew 24 and you are going to see that there are things there that people apply to the end of the world, which do not apply to the end of the world. For example, Jesus says, when you shall see Jerusalem surrounding by armies, then those that are uh, in the city should flee to the mountains. And people apply that to today. But it, it, it happened 2,000 years ago. When he says here in verse 5, many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. This happened 2,000 years ago. We might see something kind of similar taking place today but in context it happened 2000 years ago Jesus says you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars nation shall rise against kingdom nation kingdom against kingdom 
famines, pestilences, earthquakes, even though you see these things happening today, in context, he was talking about 2,000 years ago. All these, he says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations. This was true in the days of the apostles. And, and, and how do we know? Because he goes on to say, he goes on to talk about many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. In, 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 a, in a way, these prophecies had a, a double application. They have a secondary fulfillment in our day, but they were fulfilled in the days of Jesus. There was, there was this Judas and there was uh, Judas from Galilee. There were these men who were false Christs and false prophets and many others rose up claiming to be Christ. And of course, you know that. When the, when the Romans assaulted Jerusalem, there was tribulation such had never been experienced before. When women ate their own children, when they were selling, selling rats in the city and donkeys in the city for food, and people were eating their own children. When, when the Romans slaughtered over a million Jews in the final assault, when blood ran in the gutters like water. And so, anyway, I just, I just mentioned Matthew 24 because I wanted us to to see that it's a biblical principle. It's not just Ezekiel. It's a biblical principle of mixing two events in one prophecy. Look also at Malachi chapter 4. Very familiar prophecy. But it starts out by saying in verse 1, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, said the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. If I ask you, which, which day is this? You will say it is, it is after the thousand years when God destroys the earth by fire, when he burns up Satan and everything that is wicked. And um, I would agree with you. And God says, and you shall tread down the wicked and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I do this, said the Lord of hosts. Verse 3. But look at verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto you in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. What is this great and dreadful day of the Lord? See, it says in verse 1, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. This is the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And look at what he says. I will send you Elijah before this day so in context you are looking for elijah to come sometime before the second coming of jesus sometime before the world is destroyed by fire look at what jesus says in matthew 11 verses 13 and 14. for all the prophets and the, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until john and if you will receive it if you will receive it this is elijah who was for to come. So Jesus takes a prophecy that is focused on the end of time and Jesus applied it 2,000 years ago to John the Baptist. So was Jesus guilty of misinterpreting the scriptures? No, he wasn't. He wasn't. But um, what I'm trying to point out is that many of these prophecies they, 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 God has designed them in such a way that they have, in some cases, more than one fulfillment. And in some cases, they are two different ages joined together as one in the same prophecy. Many of these prophecies are not as precise and exact as we would like to think. When you come to the book of Revelation and Daniel, those are the places when you look for precision and exactness. Every word, every number, every letter. But many of these Old Testament prophecies, they had visions. It was like they went into a trance and they saw images and they, they spoke of the things they saw. But they are not the great details that we might expect when you look at a prophecy. Um, let me give you another example of this. I know I'm rambling a little bit, but I'm trying to make my point And it's not the easiest thing to explain. Look at Psalm 22. Most of us might know what Psalm 22 talks about. It's a Psalm of David. And look what it starts out with. My God, my God, why, are, why hast thou forsaken me? Who is talking here? It doesn't say, it's a psalm, it's a song that David wrote. He wrote a poem. 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and I'm not silent. It goes on to say, our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. They, they cried unto thee and they were delivered. Thou, they trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despise of the people. And you can see that this is a prophecy about Jesus. But um, look at the things that are said here. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. Where is Bashan? And what is a bull of Bashan? I mean, you can see that this is um, this is this is a, a, a figurative expression of the things Jesus was going through. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. And a lot of it is just very clear. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. And it goes on. Now, it's very clear that this is a prophecy of Jesus. But there are details in, 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 the, in the passage that don't apply directly or very clearly to what Jesus is going through. So maybe this is not the best example that I could find. But I just wanted to point out that in these Old Testament prophecies, they are kind of vague. They're not very precise. And sometimes you don't even know what they are referring to. So they need to be, be studied very carefully, and you have to you have to you have to dissect to get exactly what event they are talking about or whether they are even to be taken literally. Anyway, I'm a little bit um off off target, but I'm going to go back to Ezekiel and I'm going to go to another passage in Ezekiel. Back to Ezekiel 37. And I have a few verses to read here. Ezekiel 37. I think this is the passage that Sister Maria specifically asked about. I think this was the one. But look at what it says here. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus said the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Now, it seems at first, first glance that this is talking about the resurrection. Because God says, I will open your graves and I will cause you to come out of your graves. But then he says, I will bring you into the land of Israel. So it suggests then, if you are taking it literally, that God is going to resurrect his people and carry them down to Palestine. And that is what some people actually believe. Some people believe this literally. It goes on to say, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up, up out of your graves. Then he says, and shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, said the Lord. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take, the, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, the two houses. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions, and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus said the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and I will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. And see what God promises to do. This is the point. Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they are gone, and I will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. So it looks like this is talking about 1948 when the Jews went back to Palestine. But look at what the next part says. And one king shall be king to them all. And there shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into king two kingdoms anymore at all. 
Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things. This is not true of, of modern day Israel. And he goes on to say, and David, my servant, shall be king over them. Who is this referring to? Not David the person. Jesus. Jesus, the seed of David. And they shall all have one shepherd, and they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. But everything is being said in the context of the Old Testament and how they understood things in the Old Testament. We look at the prophecy, and it's a future prophecy, and we have to take these terms and translate them into New Testament ideas. As Brother Raymond said, David, my servant, is not going to be king over them. It's going to be the New Testament antitype of David, which is Jesus Christ, the seed of David. He's going to be the king. He's going to be the one shepherd. But the scripture says, David, my servant. God says, David, my servant, because he's using old covenant language. So when he talks about the land of Israel, and I will bring back together Israel, we have to take that and translate it into new covenant understanding. Who is Israel in the New Testament? Who are they? The, 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 the tribes of Israel in the New Testament. What does it mean to be in your own land in the New Testament? What is the, the land of God's people under the new covenant? When you're born again. When you're born again. And the land of God's people is Jerusalem, which is above, is the mother of us all. Yes, there's going to be a time when we are in a physical place. But these prophecies are not speaking yet of this. We're going to go a little further in Ezekiel, and we're going to see where it now comes to the literal fulfillment of these prophecies, of some of these prophecies. David. Go ahead, Ian. Um, <clears throat> Romans 4, <clears throat> sorry. Romans 4 and verse 13 speak about Abraham being the father of those <clears throat> who believe by faith, righteousness by faith, and not necessarily through the law. So right there, it is telling us that all, and he, this is, I, I think the apostle Paul was addressing the Roman church, which had people in it who were not Jews. Yes. And he was and, saying and, that, yeah. And in Romans 11 and Romans 12, right, might be Romans 10, Paul says, they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, but in Isaac shall they, they see be called. And Paul makes the point that, just because you're born in the nation of Israel doesn't make you an Israelite. God already established the principle that the seed would be called in Isaac. And Isaac is not a child of the flesh. He's a child of faith. So what he means is the true seed of Israel are the children who are of faith. That is Israel. That is the true Israel. Those which are of the flesh, these are not the children. This is a New Testament idea. But at the same time, the prophecies are there in the Old Testament. And you have to take them now, bring them over into our time, and apply them according to those New Testament principles. That's the point. Um, so, so God said, let's go on. Let's look at Ezekiel 38. It's interesting that many of these prophecies in Ezekiel, they're actually fulfilled or they're actually explained in the book of Revelation. Many of them. Um, here in um, Ezekiel 38, from verse 1, reading down, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Thus said the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach, of Meshach and Tubal, I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Now, just a minute here. Let me just spend a little time on this. I don't know if you have ever heard the phrase Gog and Magog before, but if you talk to many Christians, they will tell you that Gog and Magog refer to nations to the northeast of Israel. And they will tell you that these nations refer primarily to the, the Russians and the, um, and the Chinese, those nations from up that side. And what they believe is that in the end of time, sometime in our time, Russia 
and, 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 and the forces from the east are going to attack physical Israel. That's what they believe, okay? And they believe that these are the nations that are called Gog and Magog. And, and, and when it says, I will turn thee back and I will put hooks in thy jaws, it, they believe that this means that God is going to fight against these eastern forces and deliver physical Israel. So this is what the evangelicals by and large believe. So if you want to know some of the background reasons why these evangelicals are so fixated on certain things that are happening in America, this is the background to all of it. A lot of it has to do with Zionism and Israel and their obsession with defending Israel and they actually see America as some kind of extension of Israel. So they believe God is on their political side. They believe that God is into politics. But look at the verse. Look at the verse. Verse 4. Why on earth would you take a part of the verse literally? Because look at what it says. All thine army, horses and horsemen. Look how detailed it is. All of them clothed with all sorts of armor. A great company with bucklers and shields. And all of them handling swords. Don't you see that? It's very clear that we are looking at God is describing something in the context of Old Testament ideas. Because the only place people fight with swords and bucklers and shields today is in the cartoons. Right? Today they use atomic weapons and high powered uh, weapons, high powered guns and they don't they, people don't fight wars this way and yet god describes it in terms of horses and horsemen and bucklers and shields and swords because he is using old testament ideas and what we have to do is translate everything into the new covenant understanding he goes on to say in verse 7 verse 8 after many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the nations of against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Now, this prophecy, I believe, is one that takes us even beyond our time. I believe this is one of the prophecies that go way into the future. But God is speaking about it as something. In the language of the past, look what he says. The people who are gathered out of many people, they are gathered against the mountains of Israel. It is brought forth out of all nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. That's what we read at the beginning. That's what God said he would do for Israel. He would bring them back together and they'll become one stick, one nation. And he goes on to talk about this Gog and Magog. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. And what does God say? He says, and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely. All of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. He's describing a people living without any defense. There are no bars, there are no walls. And Gog and Magog comes against them. And what happens? In verse 16, thou shalt come up against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. And he says, at that time, when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, said the Lord, that my fury shall come up in my face. And he says, look what he says he will do. I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains. Every man's hand shall be against his brother. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. I will rain upon him and upon his bands and, and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. All right, let me, let me ask you. Where else in the Bible do you ever read about Gog and Magog? Revelation. Revelation. In Revelation, actually in Revelation 20. That's the other place where Gog and Magog comes up. And so what I'm saying is you, you have to you have to we have to compare and understand what God is really saying. In the old covenant, he uses 
that old covenant language, but in the New Testament, we begin to get deeper insight into what is really being spoken about here. It says, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. This is actually after the thousand years and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. That's exactly what we see happening here. They went upon the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. That's what God said he would do. I will rain upon him, rain upon him and upon his bands, and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone so we are talking about after the thousand years and this prophecy is here in ezekiel and if you look at it superficially you think it is talking about physical israel way back there in the old testament times that's why people always study these ezekiel prophecies and they say when is this fulfilled and the, the thing about it is that god gives us some very some very detailed descriptions you know, for example, he says that they will be with, with swords and with shield and buckler, and they will have horses, and they will come up. He, he gives you details about what is happening. And if, if, if you don't understand the principle of how God gives these prophecies, you say these have to mean something. What, what does a shield represent? What does, what does a buckler represent? What does a horse represent? And you're trying to do this. You are wasting your time because that is not the point. The point is that God is giving you a picture of an enemy coming against his people and the details are not important. What is important is the overall picture. Now my time is up. My time is up and I know that um, we have spent a lot of time just reading. I wanted to do this because I wanted, I wanted us to, um, to see the context of these passages. Now, there are some other passages in Ezekiel, quite a few of them, and, and it would take us a long time, maybe the, the whole day, to go through these prophecies one by one. But what I'm hoping is that as we have looked at the principle, as we have looked at the principle, you are able to apply it yourself. Because that's, that's the point. Many of these prophecies, I'm going to give you one last one, which is um, not from Ezekiel, but to look at the principle. Look at this prophecy in Amos, okay? Amos 9, verses 9 to 12. Look at what it says in Amos here. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve. It shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. All right, so God says he's going to sift the house of Israel. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake us nor prevent us. Now look. In that day, in that day, which day? In that day when all the sinners of my people shall die by the sword. In that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old. That they may possess the remnant of Edom and, all, and of all the heathen which are called by my name, said the Lord, that do it this. Now, I'd like you to look at how this passage is interpreted in the New Testament. We go to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 15. And it is, um, it is I think it's James who is talking here. James is speaking. And, and after they had held their peace, James answered saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Notice what they are talking about. They are talking about how God gave the gospel to the Gentiles and how the Gentiles were converted to Christianity. Notice that. And what James says next is interesting. James says, and to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. What James is doing is quoting now from the book of Amos, the prophecy that we just read in Amos. James is applying this prophecy to the converting of the Gentiles. In other words, where God is saying, after this I will return and will build against the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. I will build again the ruins thereof. I will set it up. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, said the Lord who doeth all these things. What did this mean? What it was pointing to was the converting of the Gentiles to Christianity. Look at both passages. It's the same exact thing. James is quoting from Amos. 
And what he's doing, he's applying that prophecy to the converting of the Gentiles over to Christianity. And he says, this is what the prophecy means. So it reinforces the point, and I make the point again that these Old Testament prophecies are not what they appear on the surface. And I know that most of the time when you are talking to somebody and they say, look, this means that the Jews are going to go back to, to Palestine and they're going to rebuild that place down there and they are God's special people. And when the enemies come against them, they are going to be destroyed and they'll, they'll, have, they'll, be seven, they'll spend seven months burying some of these people. They say this because they find these details in the Old Testament prophecies. And for you to explain that it doesn't really mean this, it's a real uphill task because it takes you have to do a, a thorough, lengthy Bible study to point out some of these things because you are dealing with people who, who don't really read their Bibles carefully. But at the same time, it is helpful for us to know that we ourselves can have a good understanding because that's, that's how truth should be. It should apply to us first of all. It should benefit us first of all. And then when it, when it benefits us, maybe we might be qualified to share with somebody else. Now, I know that this has been a real mouthful. It's not the first time we are looking at something like this, but I hope that in our examination this morning, it has, it has kind of helped us to have a broader, better understanding. I'm going to pause just one moment. My time is up. I'm going to take one minute. If there's any question, I'll try to answer. Is there anybody who has a question? Yeah, uh, we're going to continue on with the sequence because it's really good. I'm glad, I'm glad it's helpful, Brother Raymond. I'm glad it, it's helpful. Um, Brother David. Yes, brother. Chris. Um, right. You know, when you look at all these prophecies, you know, um, when you put the promise that God gave to Abraham that in in your seed all the nation will be blessed, you know, so it could not only be about Israel, could not be about Israel, and and you have a you have a particular group in America, they call it uh, I think Christian United for Israel or something like that, and. Trust me, up until this very day, they believe that Israel is still so special. Yeah. Yeah, most of those evangelicals, that's what I was trying to point out. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a deep, deeply laid foundational misconception in American evangelicalism. That is why what is happening on the political scene is not as superficial as some people think, right? It's not on the surface like many people think. They are, they are concerned about... Um, the, the, the evils of one party and they, they seem to believe that that a party is like God's gift and when they, if, if they understand the underlying deceptions that are there they would not be so confident yes anyway, yes all right thank you everyone for your participation we're going to close off at this point with prayer and then um I'll hand over to brother Howard